Teaching new shooters, cleaning muzzle brakes, and point of impact with suppressors. This week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday, our first question is from Phil, and Phil asks, I'm curious for advice on teaching new shooters how to shoot a rifle. I recently became an RSO at my local range, but can't seem to get the majority of guests renting to get a solid cheek weld. They seem scared of the rifle and try to put their heads on their shoulders. Just curious about your advice. I could try to teach new shooters. Uh, well, Phil, my first advice is uh, make sure that you are getting a rifle that is appropriate to new shooters. And what I mean by that is something like a 22, something that recoils very little. Uh, you can't take a new shooter and drop them right on a 308 or a larger rifle. Um, they just are not they don't know what to expect, so they have that fear of the unknown, and then that fear of the unknown causes them to kind of shy away from the gun. And then when they light that first cartridge off, it gets a running start and really just beats the heck out of them. Uh, so starting off with a pellet gun or a 22, and the ideal thing is a suppressed 22, uh, then you can get them used to a firearm and get them used to getting into that position on the firearm and actually shooting it. Uh, dry fire is another excellent thing to get them on it and get them through the repetitions of mounting the rifle and pulling the trigger uh, without any recoil penalty at all. Uh, but the problem with dry fire and new shooters is they don't have any basis of understanding of what that recoil is going to be like. Uh, so when you get them dry firing and then get them on the rifle, when they press that trigger, things go crazy. Uh, and then they, again, they still have that fear of that unknown before they press that trigger for the first time. So a really light recoiling rifle, get them on it, get their body position correct, uh, get them looking through the scope and tell them you don't even care where the bullet hits on the target. Uh, just get them used to mounting the rifle, get them used to feeling how that position is, that correct shooting position, and the act of actually firing the rifle. And then after that, you can go into sight alignment, sight picture, uh, and fine tuning things. Uh, but just getting them on the rifle and getting them familiar with the feel, the sound, uh, getting them familiar with that very light, very minimal recoil. And then once they're good with that, then you can move them up onto the heavy recoiling rifles. Uh, if you take a guy or a girl and you put them on a heavy recoiling rifle right off the bat, uh, more than likely you are going to turn them off to shooting for the rest of their life. I hate it all the time. We've seen all the funny videos on the internet where a guy takes his girlfriend out hands her a 12 gauge shotgun and then it just knocks the snot out of her and then you've turned that person against firearms for the rest of their life. They'll never want to go out shooting again. Uh, so we want to make sure that we start out with a very light recoiling rifle, uh, especially you want to make sure you get one that fits the shooter. If the stock is way too long or if the stock is way too short, etc., it's going to make them uncomfortable on it. And they probably do not have the vocabulary or the knowledge to be able to explain to you uh, that they're uncomfortable on the rifle. They're going to be uncomfortable on the rifle even if it perfectly fits them. Uh, so you really need to look closely and make sure you're getting the right length of pull, get the comb in approximately the right position, um, and go through those steps before they ever actually fire the shot. So just some uh, average uh, points that you should look at uh, before you turn a new shooter loose on a gun. Our next question comes from Sean, and Sean asks, What's your muzzle brake cleaning routine? I was cleaning my rifle this past time and I noticed the brake was fouled. I thought the barrel was ready for a few patches, but I think the fouled brake may have been altering my shots. The fouling was hard and I almost had to chip it away. Any pointers? Also, I think you're so I saw that you're going to be at the Guardian shoot in a couple of weeks. I look forward to seeing you there. As always, love the show. Well, Sean, uh, First of all, thank you very much. Thanks for your question. And I will be at the Guardian match. It's September 16th down at Woody's in North Carolina. Uh, so looking forward to seeing you there. And any of the rest of you guys, if you're shooting that match, uh, please make sure you roll up and say hi. I love talking to you guys. I love meeting you out in the world. Uh, so it's really fun just to chat. And I love hearing that you guys watch the show. It's a great kick for me. 
Uh, it gives me the uh, energy to keep going uh, when I've got a long week and I still have to get into the uh, studio here and actually film the show. So I love talking to you guys out in the world. If any of you are going to be at Woody's shooting the match, please come up and say hi. Now, as to your question on uh, muzzle brake cleaning, I don't do a lot of muzzle brake cleaning. It's kind of one of those things that's a little bit self-limiting. Uh, if you notice, even on a rifle where the muzzle brake is kind of caked up with carbon and fouling and that, uh, the important part of accuracy of the rifle is that crown. So if you took the muzzle brake off and you look at the crown on your rifle, uh, you'll see that the crown is still crisp and clear, that there is no carbon actually built up on the crown of the rifle. Now when you come out from the crown, uh, you get away from where the rifling transitions to the muzzle, uh, then you'll notice you'll start to get that fouling ring, that carbon ring built up there. Uh, that is pretty much limiting. If you have a rifle where the brake uh, is pretty flat with the ends of the threads, then not a whole lot of carbon builds up there. Uh, if you have a brake where the muzzle is recessed just a little bit inside that brake, you'll get much more carbon built up. Uh, and when you take that brake off, the carbon will flake and it'll be all uneven. But when everything's not disturbed, uh, that carbon is pretty even around there, so it's really not affecting much. Unless you actually get something that is intruding and touching the projectile as it goes through the brake, uh, that carbon shouldn't be affecting your accuracy at all. Now, there are guys out there, a lot of shooters, who will go and clean the brakes whenever they clean their barrels. Uh, the most common thing that I've seen is guys will take the brakes off, they'll throw them in an ultrasonic cleaner with some uh, bore solvent, and let the ultrasonic cleaner work and get that stuff off of there. Uh, as far as that ring that is left on your muzzle, uh, generally that's just going to be bore solvent in a nylon brush or a nylon scraper, something that's not going to scratch metal, and then you just have to go at it and chip it off. Uh, you can try to keep it wet with solvent and let it soak for a little while, but you just have to be really careful about what solvent you use. Uh, you can nose stand the rifle in a jar of solvent. Uh, if you suspend the rifle in some way, shape, or form, and you can put a uh, jar underneath it. Uh, if you decide to do that, I would put some patches down in the bottom of the jar uh, so that the muzzle is not sitting right on the glass. You run the risk of uh, breaking the jar and causing a huge mess. So have the muzzle sitting on patches or a sponge or something inside there and just use enough solvent just to cover the area that you're working on. Uh, you don't want to fill the jar with solvent because once it's uh, gone through and dissolved that carbon and copper and lead, uh, now you've got hazardous material and you have to dispose of it properly. You can't just pour it down the drain. Uh, so use as little as necessary. Also, again, be very careful what kind of solvent you use because there are some bore solvents that if you let them soak, uh, they will pit barrel steel very rapidly. Uh, so I wouldn't use something too aggressive if you're actually going to soak it. Uh, I like hops number nine for that because I've actually never had a barrel pitted with hops uh, and I tend to, I'm allowing it to sit and allowing the solvent to do the work instead of using mechanical friction to do the work. So I like uh, hops for any kind of soaking things. But again, you need to keep your eye on it and be careful. Uh, my opinion on it, the reason that I don't do a whole lot of barrel or uh, brake cleaning uh, is first of all, I'm a little bit lazy when it comes to rifle cleaning. I don't try to fix things until I discover that there's a problem. Uh, but then secondly, I see a lot of guys have the ability to cause a lot of damage to the accuracy of their rifle uh, by aggressive cleaning versus just uh, letting that self-limiting process continue. Our next question comes from Jimmy, and Jimmy asks, How do you account for zero shift in a well-established setup? My rifle is about 1,150 rounds into this barrel. Last weekend, it printed back-to-back sub-half-minute five-shot groups off the bipod. My downrange data has been spot-on and consistent all year at matches. However, I had to re-zero as it was grouping about one and a half inches high and left. Nothing jumps out as a loose part or damage, etc. Thanks for doing the show. Uh, well, Jimmy, judging by what you've said about the groups being very tight, uh, but having to re-zero because of a jump, I would almost bet that your rifle took a bump at some point and something shifted in it. The kind of shift that you're talking about, it doesn't take a whole lot uh, to impact the rifle or the optic to be able to cause that kind of shift. Uh, we tend to think of these things as really durable. I, I 
pick mine up by the scope all the time. I swing it around. Uh, it gets thumped and bumped, etc. Uh, but they are precision instruments, uh, so a little bit of shift can go a long way downrange on that target. But again, if you can dial it out and you don't see it reoccurring uh, later on, then I wouldn't worry about it. If it comes to the point where every range trip you're having to re-zero and adjust, uh, then it's time to run down through all your fasteners, make sure everything is torqued to spec. I like to use witness marks where I'll take a silver sharpie and I'll draw a line through the fastener and the surface on either side of the fastener. So when you glance at it, you can see if that fastener has started to back out any at all. Um, they do funny things, they back out at strange times. And things like our scope bases, generally those fasteners are underneath other things, so they're difficult to get to. But if you continually to see that shift, then you may want to totally pull your optics mounting system apart, uh, make sure that's loctited down, and make sure all those screws are in there tight. So just some options there for trying to track down that issue. But if it's a one-time deal, I would forget about it and drive on. And our next question comes from Zachary, and Zachary asks, POI change with a suppressor, and does it matter if a can offers minimal POI shift? Does it really matter since we gather new data in zero? For example, if a can is off by 0.2 mils or 1 mil, there's still an adjustment and a new zero made. Well, Zachary, you're exactly correct. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it does not really matter if your suppressor has a shift from unsuppressed to suppressed. Uh, if the rifle has a shift and you're able to dial that shift out, re-zero the rifle, and be good to go, uh, then the amount of shift really does not matter. Um, for me, I would take a greater consistent shift than I would over a lesser inconsistent shift on the suppressor. Now, it is nice when it is less of a shift, uh, because then if you switch rapidly between suppressors and unsuppressed, it's very easy to dial that shift in and go. Uh, I have at least one setup that there is no shift from suppressed to unsuppressed, and that's absolutely awesome uh, because I don't have to keep two zero settings for if I shoot that rifle suppressed or not. And if you're a guy that has one rifle and one suppressor and one scope, uh, it matters not at all because you're probably always going to shoot that suppressor on that rifle with that scope. Uh, the big benefit to having a consistent zero shift uh, that you can write down is if you are going to a state where you can't shoot a suppressor in a match, uh, then you can just dial in that shift, go out there, and on zero day, you're going to be very close, if not dead on. But again, the amount of shift doesn't really matter as long as it is a consistent shift. Uh, the main reason that I mention it when we review suppressors, like in our last uh, Gemtech Tracker suppressor review, uh, is so that you get an idea of what may or may not be normal. So if you go out and put that suppressor on your setup and it is hugely off from what I found on varying different barrel weights, uh, then you know, hey, let's stop, let's take a look and see if something's wrong before we go on. Um, if you have a massive shift, uh, then there may be something going on with the system, with the barrel threading, with the mount, etc. Uh, but a small shift, you know, whether it's two tenths of a mil or two mils, um, then, you know, well, two mils is starting to get excessive, but two tenths of a mil or one mil uh, is still good to go as long as it's repeatable. Our last question comes from Peter. And Peter asks, I have a Remington 700 Police and 308 Win with an ASC Ultra SL7 Borlock suppressor. I had the barrel threaded from a gunsmith with a professional CNC machine. If I only use the muzzle brake, the rifle shoots like normal, grouping under one inch. If I put the suppressor on, the group widens up and goes to the right by a whole foot. Is something wrong with my shooting, or is it the projectile touching the suppressor? I can't find signs for that. Or what else could be wrong here? I bought new projectiles and powder and want to try a new OCW test. My projectile so far is the Hornady Interlock and AMAX in 165 grain. Uh, well, Peter, judging by what you've said, if your rifle is accurate and zeroed without the suppressor on, and you put the suppressor on at 100 yards, uh, you're a whole foot to the right, I'm going to bet you have a baffle strike. That, that bullet is going down there and it is touching one of the internal components on the suppressor. And it may not be touching it enough to cause damage. It may just be touching it enough 
uh, to cause the bullet to veer off to the opposite direction. Uh, usually it will be in the end, the muzzle end of the suppressor, uh, I'm sorry, the far end of the suppressor, uh, and it will probably be a very, very light contact. Um, if you are unable to see it by either sighting through the bore of the rifle or taking the suppressor off and sighting through the suppressor itself, uh, then you might want to take it to a gunsmith that has a bore scope and let them look down through and look at the uh, inner diameter of each one of the baffles and see if you can see a copper streak on any one of them. The bullet shouldn't touch any of those baffles, so there shouldn't be a copper streak anywhere on any one of the baffles in your suppressor. If you see it, uh, that's a baffle strike. So the bullet is actually touching it and then uh, veering off to the opposite direction. Um, I know you said your gunsmith um, threaded the barrel on a CNC. Well, I'm not a machinist, so I'm not sure exactly on a CNC how you indicate a barrel versus how you indicate it on a manual lathe. On a manual lathe, uh, what you want when a gunsmith threads your barrel is you want them to indicate the barrel, make sure the barrel is straight by the bore of the rifle, not the outside of the rifle. Uh, some gunsmiths that don't understand that you are threading for a suppressor uh, will very often indicate on the outside of the barrel and then they'll cut your threads and you can put a muzzle brake on it and it'll be just fine because a tiny bit of angle uh, will still not take up the clearance that is built into a muzzle brake. But when you stretch a suppressor out, now that tiny bit of angle increases greatly and can take up the clearance that's built into a suppressor. Uh, so even though it was machined by a CNC, if they didn't indicate on the actual bore of the rifle and cut the threads concentric to the bore of the rifle, that may have still caused a problem. Uh, so it should be a very easy thing for you to take the suppressor back to a gunsmith, have them indicate on the, I'm sorry, take the barrel back to a gunsmith, have them indicate on the bore and have them check the run out on the actual threads of the uh, muzzle itself. And the last thing is it could be an issue with the suppressor itself. Uh, there could be a manufacturing defect in the suppressor or in the mounting system. I'm not familiar with the mounting system that you described, uh, but carbon, debris, etc., something could have built up in there and is not causing it to lock on straight and concentric to the bore, and it may be giving you a little bit of an angle and causing that problem. Uh, so those are all things that I would recommend you check out before you shoot it with the suppressor again. I definitely would not waste any time doing a load workup with that suppressor on, and I wouldn't even shoot it again with that suppressor on until you've gone through all those checks. If you are getting a baffle strike, it may be a very light baffle strike now, but you may get a more severe baffle strike that could destroy the suppressor uh, or cause injury. So definitely stop shooting it until you figure out what is going on. And I hope that gives you some ideas on uh, how to try to track this down. That's all we have for this episode of Mail Call Mondays. I hope you guys have enjoyed the show as much as I've enjoyed answering your questions. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, if you're listening to us on a podcast, you can go ahead and send your questions to 8541tactical at gmail.com. And we look forward to answering them on the next Mail Call Mondays. And until next time, get out and shoot! <laughs>